Hi, everyone, and welcome to Signature West Podcast. I'm your host, Sam West, from Palm Springs, California. My guest today is Adrian Christian. Adrian was known as a kid as a school misfit by day and a showbiz clubber by night. He's here with us today to share how he evolved from that title to where he is now and what's life been like for him. Hi, Adrian. Hey, how are you, Sam? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Nice to be here. So you started in the industry very young. Mm -hmm. Um, And you started at a place called the apartment in the Bronx in New York. Right. How old were you and what was that like? Well, I was, you know, I wanted, I always wanted to put a nightclub back together. And I was 15 at the time. I was, I was in high school. And, but, um, but basically, you know, I had done a show because in the daytime I was, I was in school, but at night I went to another school in New York to take up acting, singing, you know, work out, you know, and, and so um, there was a show and I performed in it and someone spotted me there at, at this school show. And they said, you would be great for, you know, this club because I was, well, I was always openly gay. And, 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 and at that time they had never heard of, you know, a, a, a guy singer singing in a nightclub. The only people that performed in nightclubs in gay clubs at the time were drag queens. Still so, you don't see what you many of that. This was, oh, this was, all right, now you're going to date me. All right, so it was, it was in the early 80s. And it was a long time ago. So right. what happened was I was 15 and, and in order to work, I had to be 18, but I lied about my age and I performed for the owner and he put me in the act and he paid me um, to perform there. And so that was the beginning of my nightclub act. And then I, from there, I kept performing you know, like in, in any place that would book me, but I was doing that and um, nobody in school knew. <laughs> so was, was, was double it, life, you know. Is it fair to say that that era that you were in was pretty much the disco era? I mean, I was in that era. I grew up and I was in school in that era. To be honest, it was the post-disco. So, you know, village people were in the 70s and early 80s and they, and they had they had done it, but they had started out in gay clubs also, Correct. but they, but they were, once they went mainstream, they, you know, women loved them and they were thought of as hot, sexy, you know, they, like, it was almost like Liberace where women loved them. So what were you, so what talk was your about style? being gay, you know? So what was your style then that when you went into that whole scene, what were you being defined as, as an artist? It was club music. It was a club. I was a club artist and it was post disco because it was right after, you know, it was right into the AIDS era. Right. Which is a whole different, you know, and so that was what, right when studio 54 was breaking out, it was, it, it was ending and it was, it was changing, but dance music was becoming more underground. So it went from disco to dance music, and then right. Mad- and then Madonna came. Of course, and then the world changed. So at right. what point did you dive into country lyrics and songs? It's so interesting because that just completely came by accident. I when I moved to LA in the last, you know, in the last ten years, in the last five years, I was working with my producer who is from Ohio, but we were working uh, recordings here, and then he moved to Nashville. I always had this kind of a, you know. I always had this kind of a twang um, in my okay. voice. Oh, yeah, like like it lent itself. The material spoke to me, and when I, and but so you, when I met, you're from New York. How did that happen? Right, because Sudi, the songwriter for Midnight Will Be Clear, and I are both from New York. He's from Long Island. I'm from New York City. But we grew up on country, country radio because in New York, there was country radio and there was everything. It was, the whole range was there. So we grew up listening to Dolly Parton, Crystal Gale, you know, Loretta Lynn, you know, Johnny Cash. So we knew, we, we liked, it was a part of our, it wasn't so segregated back then. So it was a part of our lives. And so 
when so when I met him here in LA, um, he had a catalog of songs and he had this song and it just felt like, oh my goodness, I could, it just spoke to me. It's, I don't look necessarily at genre. If a song is a good song, I go for it. Did you feel you had to differentiate between the disco era that you grew up in and the new era that you're, that you're getting familiar with? Not necessarily because there were so many phases and stages between that time and this time. And I always thought of myself as a pop singer first. Like so, I thought pop music was always the first and foremost. What was what was happening at the moment was was pop music for me. And and if pop was disco, then I sang disco. If pop was country, then I sang country. So you, you, when you were seven years old, you were singing in the school church. And yes. when you moved to L.A., you got involved with a church, an LGBTQ church, and that's, yeah. I think, when then your lyrics start to be even more faithful, and you had a little bit of another change in your music writing, is that correct? Sam, I'm so glad you said this, because the truth is, is that is that I felt like it was a full circle moment when, when I discovered that church in LA and it was an LGBTQ church. I had come out of New York at the time. I was an adult by then. So in my beginning at age seven was that I always felt a connection with God. I always felt like I was singing to God and I always felt the presence of God. And then, you know, and then of course I went to club music and I was singing clubs and concerts and doing different things. But when I moved to LA, it was because I left a record deal on the table in New York. I'm gonna get to that, that in a minute. I'm gonna right. get to that in a minute. But so when I came to LA, and this, here's the 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 thing is that I, you know, I didn't see a, a lane for me. And the lesson here is is that if you can't, if you hit a bump, you go to another road. You just you just keep moving. So when I came to LA. I found this church that was LGBTQ inclusive and and I, I heard Christian music again after a long time and I felt like it called me, like I felt right about it. So that I spent sense. 10 years singing in sense. churches. So yeah. now you're full circle and the new Adrian Christian is? Is a pop singer that has a holiday album and this song lends itself to a country flavor. It's kind of like Sting, you know, like Sting is a pop rock artist, but sometimes in his albums, you'll hear a country song. Like that's kind of like how I think of myself. Okay, fair enough. In 2000, in 2000 this is my best part because I love country yeah. music. In 2000, <laughs> you um, had a top 40 hit. Um, in the clubs. In the clubs. Mm -hmm. And you walked away from a major recording deal label because um, the way I understand it, there was a refusal of, of you hiding your sexual orientation. Yeah. What was it that was about a, and how, yeah. and what to whom and how did the end of it, how did it end in the end? It was such a weird time to be making music because the internet had not taken over yet and uh, you know Napster and, and the whole breaking of audio. And so radio was still king and record labels were still the ones that made the artists. And at the time, Ricky Martin was the artist of the moment in that label. And I, I crashed a, a, a Christmas party of all things at, with the la at the label. The label had a Christmas party and I walked in there and I was invited by a DJ and they, they took an interest to in me because of this top 40 hit. And so when I, so, so I met with them in, um, in their offices in New York. And when they sat with me and they heard my music and they saw my videos, they saw my pictures and all that, the, the feedback was, we think you're too gay. And I don't know what that meant because I was trying to process this is that. Two this is the year 2000? Right, and they were afraid that women wouldn't buy my record if they knew I was gay. So Did you mention, can you mention the record label name? Well, it was Ricky Martin's label and it was Sony. And so it was the biggest label on earth at the time. Sony, you know, Sony in 2000, Music. year 2000. Yeah thought right. that somebody could sound too gay. 
not sound too gay, but look too gay, kind of like in my videos or my pictures or my, you know, choices in my clothing or whatever, their idea was that I'd be straight and that I would do red carpets with women, that I would make videos with women in bikinis or whatever. And wow. I just thought to myself, like that, you know, like what they did with Pitbull and like what they right. did with all these guys that have these videos. And I thought to myself that that was a lie. I thought yeah. this is not that I have anything against beautiful women in my videos. It's just, it's not who just you are. that it's just that I didn't want to put out the lie because I couldn't lie to my audience. And I thought, I thought being a singer is a relationship between an artist and an audience. And if you lie to them, they'll never forget that. And there were so many artists that hid their, you know, identity, George Michael, you know, all these things in the past. And I felt like, no. And so eventually we had to break out of that. And we have Adam Lambert and we have Sam Smith. And, and right now the kids and the, my producer, who's, you know, in his twenties, he doesn't get the whole thing. He's like, Boy, what, what were they 84. talking about? Boy, George was 84, 86. Right, but you had to kind of be a little bit of a freak. You had to kind of like be either all out there, but you or, could be a regular looking guy and then be gay. Like there was a problem with that. You ha If you looked flamboyant or effeminate or like a drag queen or something like that, that would be okay. like, okay, that's a freak show. But no, it, it's like for me to be a guy, and then to say, oh, I really make love to men. You know, that was a little much for them. They couldn't handle that. The but right. I wasn't doing, you know, I wasn't making a porno. I was singing right. a song about right. love. I hear, right. I hear. <laughs> well, you know what? Good for you. It's, this is one of my, uh, one of my highlights points for this interview because I, I do admire that. I don't think we should settle for anything. I had to walk away and that walk was away. easy. Walk yeah. away with your integrity and walk away with your pride and um, don't give in. Don't give in. And Sam, get this. This is something I have not told other people in interviews, but imagine walking away and I go, go to LA. Imagine that other friends of mine that they kept their careers and I'm watching them succeed. And it was hard. It's very painful. It was hard. It's very painful. Yeah. It's very painful. So I had to, I had to just kind of like pretend that I was nothing. Mm -hmm. I went to LA and start over and I didn't you know, like no but one knew what I had what? done I in was, New York. I was just watching Howard Stern, not because I'm a fan. And um, there was a guy, I forget his name, African-American. I guess he was up for the part with the movie Ace Ventura, which uh, Kim Carey mm. took it. And wow. they, went to this, they went to this screening. You know, I'm not a big fan of Kim Carey either. But they mm -hmm. went to the screening when the movie came out. And everybody said, you know, Chris Rock, this gentleman that was on uh, Howard Stern. Because he turned it down, the gentleman on the with, uh, the African American gentleman turned that ball down, and everybody mm -hmm. at the screening said this movie will go nowhere, and of course in the making you know a hundred million dollars. So the person that turned it down because obviously based on a bad script or bad material, whatever, he said, you know what, what's done is done. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't see myself doing that, and somebody like Jim comes on crazy and doing his crazy thing and. Somebody yes. liked it and made that kind of money. Well, go get them. But I couldn't see myself. So yeah, if you don't see yourself doing it, you know, don't do it. Yeah, I believe that what comes to you is for you. And it's like everyone has their path. And there are certain things that were meant, like that was meant for Jim Carrey. And that's okay. And you know, it's not like... Very well. Yeah, exactly. It, it it catapulted him out of In Living Color and it was very important. And so, right. and, and then, and then you know, Howard Stern had a different purpose. And it's so interesting because his purpose has a lot to do with truth. And ultimately, that's what, where he landed. And then he obviously did a lot of work and wrote some books. And so, like, yeah. you know, everyone's got a path, right? Yep. So yep. that's what yep. it yep. is. So you're also from, um, you had a tour. Yes. Uh, forget how many cities tour that started before COVID, mm -hmm. and when COVID came, it kind of came to a halt. Is that correct? Well, I was I was breaking from that. I finished that leg, and I was going to go into an international leg. But first, I had recording to do. So in January and February of 2020, I was recording "Midnight Will Be Clear" and a bunch of other songs for two projects. And so I had my vocals done and I, and I ultimately mixed the song during the pandemic virtually, but, um, but a lot of the work was done. And so I was going to then go to four other countries, Germany, Canada, um, South Africa, 
and um, you know, and uh, Canada. And so it was, uh, so, so that's gonna, you know, move to 2022. So how many, how many, how many cities or stops? That was 50 delayed? dates over a three year period that I had done. And, you know, and we made a stop in Puerto Rico. We, we went everywhere and it was all these churches right. because I was doing, because I have an EP called The Song For You. And there are some Christian songs in there and some pop songs as well. So, um, so I had that audience already, um, you know, who were interested in me. So I, I went out on, on that first tour. The other interesting thing about coming to LA is that in that 10 year period, you know, I discovered that church, I just rediscovered Christian music. But in that 10 year period, what happened was it wasn't because of that, it was because, because the Supreme Court ruled on gay marriage. And when that happened in, middle, in the middle of the decade, you know, 2015 or so, that's when the shift started happening where the doors were open for me. Suddenly I met my producer, suddenly I was recording, suddenly people were interested in me because right. then, then, because I didn't have to try to be anything else and I could be myself. But as far as a tour, so COVID comes, yes. you're in the middle of the tour, you did two singles and you want to yes. go back, but you can't go back to on tour. So now where's the rest yes. of the tour stand? Well, the tour is going to resume in 2022 internationally. So here's, and, a, big, here's a bigger question. Okay, let's stop yes. with that. And then, I'll, so and then you, I'll still come back to the States as well. Yeah. So you're planning 2022, and we don't know what that's going to look like at all, because we're, you know, it's not going to be the same as it was in 2019. So yes. how is that feeling you as far as the production, as far as the traveling, as far as this? I mean, things are still pretty dicey. Is that whole thing on hold until things get figured out? Or you're just sort of hoping and wishing and praying? You know, it's going to be, I mean, I always knew that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's going to be about the vaccine. And it's going to be for myself to be able to have the vaccine before, you know, and all of us before we can all feel like we can congregate again and join again and go to places and do clubs because I want to go to nightclubs too. So you do, so I, you, so you do believe that the nightclub thing will come back? I do. I do. And I, I just think it's, you know, if you look at history in 1918 for the Spanish flu pandemic, it took three years for that to clear. Three. And I, and then they were going through the same fights. They were doing the same thing with masks and everything. So I think that it's just a matter of time. Now this year in December, I just did one time I went to sing at my home church in North Hollywood, California. And we did that virtual like through video right, um, right, right, broadcast. Right, we right. did that, but to, 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 for people to get together again, I think so. My mother was saying to me like, oh, we're never gonna get together again. I said, we will. We will. Okay, I hope you're right. Speaking yeah. of your mother, your mother is a Puerto Rican descent? Yes. And um, in 2019, you did a Puerto Rico mission project. Yes. What was that all about? I was really miffed that the people in Puerto Rico had been ignored from the devastation of Hurricane Maria. And so, um, so people there were forgotten and they were living without rooftops. They had no roofs. They, some of them had blue tarp. FEMA, the emergency um, service was not reaching them and they were just forgotten. And there were people, you know, they needed, they were promised $20 billion from the US government and right. they needed 90 billion, but they only got $14,000. Right. And so, you know, people didn't have water, people didn't have, you know, so I connected with the church over there that I was going to sing in on my tour. But before anything else, I said to them, look, what do you need? They said, we need rooftops. I said, done. So I did this Facebook fundraiser. Uh, and then five of us from LA joined, went over there. And we, we raised over nine, I was raising 5,000, we raised over $9,000. And we, and all the steel panels that were for these roofs were going directly to them. It was very clear and transparent. We paid for our own airfare. So we took nothing out of the fundraiser and it went all to the roofs and we put up roofs ourselves and we, and we filmed it. And so more of that is going to show in a, in a short documentary, but we, um, and the work is still being done. You know, there's been so much interruption between well, earthquakes and, never, and, never, yeah, and, and, and hurricane. 
and then the and then the COVID pandemic too. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. we can't, you know, we can't proceed, but we but we started. We started it. Good for you. Good for you. This is what I love what people do and stuff like that. It was one of the most important days of my life, Sam. Like it was like right up there with you know anything that I've accomplished because to be able to go to a knock on strangers' doors and tell them, listen, we're going to put the roofs up ourselves. It was amazing how so people what is as together. was it as big as the day you walked out on that record deal? Yeah, because it was uh, the, the 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 central theme is being who you are, and right. this felt to me so true. And it was near where my mother was born, where we went. And right. so, it, you know, she's from Lajas, Puerto Rico. We went to Mayagüez and Cabo Rojo, and it was so um, pe the people there are so decent, and they never ask or complain. Right. So it's just so amazing that you know they receive you and they want to serve you something, but they have nothing. It just it just breaks your heart that they're that they're forgotten that way. So it was. It was one of the most uh, beautiful moments for me, and and you know, and and I continue to con contact those people there, and I'll go back there and perform. They want me there in the Pride March. Oh, that's another thing, Sam. You know, back in the day when I was a kid, there was no Pride, there was no out gay people. Now there's a whole gay community there. It's just shocking. Right, right. So your last, your your most recent single called Midnight will be clear. Yes. Which was written by a mutual friend of ours, Rick Cavares. Yes. yes. Uh, let's just send him some good energy. Rick is battling COVID right now. And um, hopefully he's doing better. And uh, hopefully we'll come out of it clear and good to go. Yeah. So um, um, absolutely. What, was, what was the idea behind the song? Well, for him, it was a play on the Christmas song, uh, um, you know, it came upon a midnight clear and he had a twist on it. And then he thought about the recovery community. The song is about a man who becomes sober and he's about to have the best Christmas of his life because he can see clearly. And so by midnight, midnight will be clear. So for, for him, he thought of it as a, you know, uh, you know, how it came to him because he doesn't, he's not a drinker. I'm not a drinker. I don't drink. And so we didn't have that experience, but he was inspired. And I thought to myself, this would be, I've never heard a Christmas song like it. So it, it's not what I thought. It's different. not what I thought it was going to say by the title, but I'm glad I asked. It's yeah. Not, I don't know. Yeah. I thought it was something else completely. What did you think? Uh, midnight would be clear. Santa Claus will come down. It's going to be a clear <laughs> winter night. Mm -hmm. And the snow will come down. Presents will mm -hmm. be in the air. Yeah. You know, la, la, li, la, it's la, It's a surprise. La. It's a surprise <laughs> yeah. because the thing is, is that you don't expect it. So when you hear it, you go, oh, there's something well, let, to we'll, this song. Well, let's hear it. Can we hear it? Sure. Let's As we end the show. All righty. And Sam, it's been great. And I want to thank you and your listeners. My pleasure. This Christmas Eve in the past, we would go to midnight mass. Sing songs of praise, with Jim on his breath, his mind in a hand. Not a day went by, we didn't need to get higher. Taste of the strength, as sweet as the sound of the choir. And it's every song of the season, he's always bringing in tears. He's bringing in tears, let's a little shine. He put on the bottom of the cold and steady. He's just listening to me. Very, very uh, country, but very, very healing, very pretty. Chris, Adrian, yeah. thank you so much for coming here. Um, I learned a lot. I, was, I usually do every time I do one of these shows. Um, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, good luck with your new future tour after COVID and yeah. with the single. I appreciate you. To the audience, uh, I hope you were inspired. I hope you've learned something new. 
So till next time, I am Sam West with Signature West Podcast. Till then, be safe, happy new year, and take care of yourselves. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Adrian. God bless. God bless.